Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars on a, you know, it, again, I really can't complain about the temperature this morning. It's probably in the low 70s. The humidity is at a minimum. It's just not that bad. Now, that's not to say that I can't complain about the weather because, honestly, the weather has been... Well, it's been not what we really want down here. This is the first video I've done since the hurricane. And of course, everybody will have heard about the hurricane. And in fact, I think Naples uh, has been in the national news a fair bit uh, based on the hurricane. And uh, that is what it is. But I can tell you that there have been some rumors of my death, apparently. Some phone calls came into Auto House, uh, you know, explaining that, you know, I had died. And they were obviously greatly exaggerated because here I am now. I was not carried off by a twister, uh, drowned in a flood, uh, or hit by a coconut flying through the air at 150 miles an hour. I'm still here. I'm still going. And uh, today marks the first day that I'm sort of getting back up on my feet. And I'm doing that with one of Uncle Johnny's cars. Uh, Uncle Johnny, a guy that we get some great cars from, uh, he's given me this one. The only car that I had ready to go. I have a bunch of cars. I've been out on a buying spree. I have shitloads of them. None of them are ready. Not a single one except for a tan 76 Ford station wagon. And I just did a tan. Well, it wasn't a Ford, but I just did a tan wagon. So it seemed silly to sort of follow up. So I made a desperation call to Johnny yesterday and he lent me this, uh, which is a 1965 Pontiac Bonneville convertible, uh, which we'll get into a minute. So so let me give you a quick hurricane update. I mean, the devastation down here is pretty horrible. Not for all of us. I mean, you know, you drive through Naples today and everything actually looks pretty normal. There's no issues at all. All the stores are open. The electricity's on. We're pretty good at handling these things down here. It's just not, you know, it's just not unusual for us to get big storms. Uh, but this one did throw us all for a loop. And uh, mainly that was because of the storm surge, uh, which I'll get into in a minute. But uh, the devastation in some areas is just terrible. Absolutely terrible. Uh, geography forever changed. My favorite little bait shop a place that I absolutely loved. I'd go in there and get shrimp and pinfish to go fishing for, you know, snook and mangrove snapper and that sort of thing. Well, they were devastated. They were completely blown out. That's gone forever. And probably all the fishing spots have changed. So I'm going to have to, you know, change that up as time goes on. But, you know, that's the worst of the way it affected me. Then, again, I got very lucky. The cars that I had, all of them were in a weird area that could could have been bad but wasn't. Uh, they ended up surviving, thank God, uh, because frankly they're all <laughs> they're all uninsured, which is you know just the way that it goes. And uh, had they been flooded out, man, would I be doomed, absolutely doomed. But they lived, they made it through the storm, okay, and that's you know that's great. Uh, the house that I sold in July. Uh, was under six feet of water. So, you know, I got pretty lucky there, I have to say. I'm sorry for the new owners. Good news is they hadn't really moved in yet, so they didn't lose too much other than they have to remodel the remodeling they just did. So, uh, but that said, you know, I'd have lost everything that I had around there if I'd still been there. So somebody was looking after me that, um, that, that I was able to get out of that place a couple of months ago. And uh, otherwise, you know, it just, you, you get used to these things. You're set up for them. We lost power for about four days. Uh, you know, we've got generators in the garage. I had one running the water system and the AC. I had another one running the refrigerator and the TV and stuff. So uh, it really it was a pretty mild way of flushing in, you know, a hurricane or, you know, not, it just didn't affect me as much as it did. I mean, there's some poor guys up in their attics of avoiding floodwaters. And, you know, that was that surge thing. And man, that was the part that took us all down here by surprise. Every year, every time there's a hurricane, Anderson Cooper, or Jim Cantori, or one of these weather guys, go, oh, the storm surge, the storm surge, it's going to be 15 feet, we're all going to drown. And you just, you know, when it doesn't happen, 
for years and years and years, you just shrug it off. You start to laugh it off. And that's what we all did. So we all prepared for wind damage, for, you know, the, the, the flying object damage. You put up your storm shutters. Nobody thought there was going to be this big surge of water. And all of a sudden there was. For the first time, all their predictions came true. And, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, areas around Naples and Fort Myers just absolutely went underwater. First time I've seen it since you know, I've been paying attention as a little kid in 1975. Uh, and with the water, by the way, what is it with small SUVs? I mean, I don't know the kind of people that drive these things, but they're obviously complete idiots. You know, I went down to uh, where I had the cars parked. I tried to get there. I couldn't get there because about halfway, there were white caps at the Naples City Airport. I mean, literal white caps on the runway. It was insane. Uh, and uh, a few miles after that, I got you know, couldn't make it any further in my 2500 pickup truck. And the whole way, all I saw were these little SUVs. I don't know if these people think they can fjord rivers like the African safari land rovers or something but you know they try they suck air into the intake they blow out their engines and then the stupid things are stalled in the roads and i saw hundreds of them i mean uh, they were just full of ford escapes and hyundai santa fe's and mazda cx-5s you know all of them now totaled because some idiot had to go out and do a tour uh, after the storm in three feet of water it just didn't work out for him at all and apparently there were a bunch of flooded electric cars which just were exploding and giving firefighters a hard time. So there we have some modern problems. And uh, of course there were electric cars because uh, this really affected the wealthy areas down here for the first time. I mean, you know, the wealthy guys have homes that are all built for wind damage. There's no issues with them. They're impact windows and shutters and that sort of thing. All of a sudden, they're contending with, you know, eight feet of water, and that changed everything. So hundreds and hundreds of really, really nice cars uh, were lost down here, just gone, gone forever. And, uh, you know, some of the pictures are absolutely heartbreaking. There's one I saw with a yeah, super bird on its roof. And you just look at that and think, oh, God, I mean, that car is going to be saved, you know, for sure. It's worth saving. But I can't imagine. I, I know people, you know, I know a home watch guy whose customers uh, on the, the west of 41 lost, you know, 10, 12 cars. And uh, that's just the, the very beginning of what happened. So uh, it really was quite a devastating storm for us down here. Uh, if it hadn't been for the surge, though, it would have been just another day. It really would have been. The surge is what blew it all. If there's one silver lining for me, it's that a bunch of animals probably got swept out to sea. I imagine there's a bunch of goats that are running around now on, you know, life rafts and they have volleyballs that they're playing with and uh, you know probably some uh, deer oh my god what the hell is this hey big fella oh he's going after Peter and his Kubota you know, I know you, 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 the guy have to come around here as I'm doing this thing. I mean there's no reason he didn't stop up here he went to the back why didn't he just go straight to the back I think he likes being on video uh, but anyway, surely a bunch of animals got swept out to sea or carried off by some of the spawn twisters, and that's just fine with me. And uh, it also seemed to sweep in some pretty good weather. Uh, all of a sudden, even though it's early October, which could be very hot down here, uh, the weather is almost the, you know, nice season stuff where it's 70 degrees and uh, no humidity and... We at least have that going for us. So, look, it's, it's all dreadful, but, you know, we have to be thankful for coming through it okay. And uh, we have to just move forward, which is what we're going to do. We're going to get on with this review right now. So, uh, this is a 1965 Pontiac Bonneville convertible. Uh, and it's a rather gorgeous offering from, you know, the now defunct company and, and when it was in its prime, which was really in the 1960s. Uh, the first Pontiac hit the showroom rooms in 1926 so it's a pretty old company uh, but that said it's when GM realized there was a sales sweet spot between Chevy and uh, their now long defunct Oakland division uh, for which Pontiac was made out of thin air to be a companion make so I mean it's not much different from Lexus or 
even Saturn. I mean, it was just something that came out of a corporate committee. There was no, you know, other than the famous Indian chief, who obviously wasn't building cars, uh, there was no Mr. Pontiac, who was slaving away in his workshop, you know, uh, creating one of the first motor vehicles. There were no inventor brothers, you know, workaholics coming up with the Pontiac division that would later get absorbed into GM. Uh, Pontiac was just created out of whole cloth by a corporate General Motors to fill a hole uh, in their lineup. And obviously it was engineered very well. They did a fantastic job with it uh, because it proved more popular than Oakland, significantly more, and actually replaced them by 1932. Uh, it, it enjoyed a fair amount of success during the pre-war era. Their sales were great, obviously good enough to take over Oakland. Uh, but after the war, they really hit the doldrums. Uh, the cars had essentially become sort of dowdy and old-fashioned. And there was some talk in GM of killing the division, that it just wasn't doing anything. Uh, but a few guys said, nah, look, we can do something with that. Uh, we can make it happen. And then on July 1 of 1956, a very well-connected guy named uh, Seaman, <clears throat> Seaman Bunky Knudsen, uh, became Pontiac's general manager uh, at the rather young age of 43, and he was handpicked by GM Brass to turn the division around, and that is exactly what he set out to do. Uh, he partnered up with a performance-minded 31-year-old, a guy named John Z. DeLorean. Uh, you may have heard of him, and the two of them sort of went to work, and uh, work they did. I mean, the first thing Knudsen did when he came in uh, in 1956, the 57 cars were just about to come out. They still looked dowdy and old-fashioned. So he had the guys rip all the trim off the hoods. This must have drove Harley Earl crazy, by the way, uh, to make them look more modern. Uh, and, I mean, this was with weeks to go before production. So, I mean, it was a big deal. But the guy hit the ground running. And they, they, that's where this car sort of comes into play. Uh, Newton viewed Pontiac's big problem as its grandma image, is the way he called it. Uh, and he needed to do away with that. So during the 57 model year, he was able to quickly put out the Harley Earl had designed a car called the Pontiac uh, Star Chief Custom Bonneville Convertible. Uh, which was um, probably meant to be more of a show car than a production car, but they actually put it out. You know, Chevy was coming out with the 57, which was uh, a huge deal at the time. Pontiac wanted a piece of that because they knew that car was going to be big. And uh, their answer to it was the Star Chief Bonneville model. Uh, it came with their 347 cubic inch V8 with a version of the Rochester fuel injection uh, that was on some of those Chevys. And on top of that, uh, they decided to make it compete with Chrysler's sort of upmarket 300C, which was a very expensive car. Uh, so the Star Chief Bonneville had every available, I, I won't call it an option because it all came standard. Everything came standard, with the exception of air conditioning and a Continental kit, everything came on the car you know, as standard, and it was super expensive, about $60,000 in today dollars, which is a lot, uh, and uh, was essentially more expensive than another one. Another one. What the hell is this thing? Oh, God. Hey, Rouse, who the hell are you? There have never been dogs here. There have never been dogs here. Who... Peter's got food somewhere. Anyway, it was more expensive than a Cadillac, uh, the, the entry-level Cadillac, and they only made 630 of them, and they're extremely collectible today. Uh, but that wasn't the first time the Bonneville name was out there. It was the second. Uh, the first time the Bonneville name came out, which Bonneville Bay is named for the Bonneville Salt Flats, of course, in Utah, uh, which was named for some army officer who apparently found a path you know, through there to California or something. Eventually he came up with the California Trail that the Gold Rush guys used, but, uh, and a bunch of crap is named after him. But, uh, but anyway, that's where the name came from. And then in 54 at the Motorama Auto Show, uh, there were two Bonneville Pontiac show cars, which were essentially 54 Corvettes with different 
mildly different styling. And I think they were kind of indicative of Pontiac's eternally unfulfilled desire uh, to have a Corvette of their own. It just never happened. It was something they always wanted. Uh, GM always thought it would be crazy to have competition internally for the Corvette, so uh, so they didn't get it. I remember DeLorean got the, uh, he got the Firebird instead of the Corvette that he wanted, and he did a lot with it, but, uh, but that was an unfulfilled thing. So that Star Chief was the second Bonneville, and then in 1959, um, actually, sorry, in 1958, that was the first true production Bonneville, the first true, you know, car model that was named that, and they came out for Pontiac, they were uh, convertibles and coupes, they were the top of the line, and, oh my God, who are you? Who, oh, oh my God. Jesus, that was close. Anyway, um, they came out in 58, and they very quickly, not immediately, but in that model year, got a tri-power setup. That's three two barrels, a uh, big induction system uh, that bumped the horsepower up to like 330 or something, and was sort of uh, an indicator of the performance-minded crap at Pontiac that was just starting to happen. Uh, you had Knudsen, you had DeLorean, and also a guy named Pete Estes, um, all legends in the car world, and they were very quickly turning the company with a grandma image into GM's hottest performance division and uh, that would continue on for many years. Uh, in 59 they began advertising the vehicles benefited from a wide track uh, stance that was a famous Pontiac thing. Uh, if you remember the uh, ads, they were between 59 and 71, quite a few of the Pontiac ads featured uh, illustrations from Art Fitzpatrick and Van Kaufman, and the ads always emphasized the wide track styling. You know, they looked like they were just enormously wide, wider than they really were, but you know, that's just the way the ads looked. Uh, and they put the cars in all sorts of elegant scenarios, like ski clubs and fancy restaurants in the middle of Paris, you know, that's where you'd see Bonnevilles, and uh, always parked next to jets. And those ads were a big deal in Pontiac marketing and actually helped propel the car, uh, or at least the brand, to become the third best-selling brand by 1961. So really an incredible turnaround for the division uh, based on the labors of uh, Knudsen and, you know, some other pretty cool cats. Um, Pete Estes, he, well, what, he took over Pontiac as general manager in 61 when Knudsen was promoted to Chevy, uh, to run Chevy. Uh, he worked uh, with, Ch chief engineer was John DeLorean next to him, and they continued to push for high-performance cars at exactly the right time. And even though GM was kind of out of motor racing, Pontiacs were making a mark in it. Uh, in 62, Fireball Roberts won the Daytona 500 in February, uh, driving a Catalina that was tuned by Smokey Eunuch. A guy named Joe Weatherly won nine races in Pontiacs in the NASCAR championship. Uh, so all of a sudden, this dowdy old car company is starting to make it work, you know, on the street and in racing with what's considered to be fairly high-performance vehicles. And then DeLorean, uh, in 63, came out with the Tempest GTO, which was another way for him to get around sort of GM's frowning on motor racing. And what he did there was take the motor from this car, essentially, a 389 uh, with a four barrel, and stuff it into uh, their smallest and lightest car, the Tempest. They called it the GTO, uh, sort of hearkening to uh, the Italian you know, race cars and Le Mans and all that sort of thing at the time. And uh, basically, he ushered in the muscle car era. So, man, did DeLorean make a real splash at Pontiac as he went on. And he took over in 1965 and uh, really made the company thrive all throughout the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, he also created the affordable personal luxury car uh, by moving the full-size Grand Prix uh, down to uh, an intermediate platform in 69. They'd only sold 31,000 full-size Grand Prix's and these are cars I really like, by the way, uh, but they also were very similar to the Bonnevilles, and uh, the price wasn't that much different. So, you know, you're kind of competing against each other within the division. So he took that full-sized car, he made it a uh, mid-sized car, and they went from selling 31,068 to 
112,000 uh, in 1969, which was an enormous improvement, obviously caught the attention of the uh, top, top brass at GM, and they very quickly moved Orion to uh, the chief of Chevrolet in 1969, uh, which was great for him, but came at a very high cost for Pontiac. Uh, by 72, they dropped out of third place in the sales race and uh, would never really recover. You know, pretty soon they would be making Aztecs, and it's just kind of a damn shame. Uh, you know, they did. Look, Pontiac kept it going longer than most. You know, they dumped the GTO. They didn't develop it. Was, it was a bit of a shame, but they did keep the Trans Am going. And I'd consider the 79 Trans Am to be the last real muscle car, you know, long after the Malays era had taken over everything else. So, uh, you know, Pontiac's performance lasted... Yeah, it lasted for quite a long time. And then there were little signs of hope after that. In the 80s, there was that turbo Trans Am. Um, you know, in the 90s, some of those WS6 formulas and Trans Ams. But, you know, they really didn't have anything that Chevy didn't have. They didn't have any way to make their mark the way they had in the 60s. GM had become much more corporate and unified. And uh, it just, you know, eventually didn't work out for them. And they ended up going defunct, which was a shame. Absolute shame. Uh, so then, look, that's the brief history of the heyday of Pontiac. I'm going to take a quick bit there. Oh my God. Hello. Hello there. Who are you? Hello. Okay, I'm going to take a break there. Hopefully this dog doesn't attack me uh, while I'm doing that. And then we're going to come back and get into this car. So bear with me one moment. All right, so having gone over that uh, sort of history of the heyday of Pontiac, let's take a look at this specific car, which is technically what this review is supposed to be about. So uh, we'll have a quick look. Uh, again, it's a 1965 Pontiac Bonneville convertible. Uh, at the time, they were sold in convertibles, coupes, which had a bit of a fastback look to them. And uh, of course, the big safari wagons. They were enormous, absolutely enormous. They had stretched out the wheelbase. If I remember right, it's 124 inches uh, in this year. Uh, it was based on the B-body platform, which was, of course, uh, you know, GM's full-size platform. And uh, this 65 was the first year of the fourth generation Bonneville. Uh, and that was a badge that would continue across 10 generations until 2005. So uh, the name is certainly cemented into the uh, annals <clears throat> of uh, car history. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and you know, it's a shame there'll never be another one. I mean, there are going to be no more Pontiacs. Each year, there's less and less Pontiacs, you know. Uh, obviously, there's a few in collections and a few driving around, but, you know, soon it's just not going to be something that your average guy remembers and it'll go the way of Oakland and it's just kind of a shame to me that that's the way that uh, Pontiac, you know Saturn who gives a crap I'm glad it's gone nobody cares Pontiac oh god that was a real loss a real loss uh, but what a beautiful car this is so B body platform full frame rear wheel drive it's got very rakish lines everywhere it's got uh, accentuated coke bottle styling, as they call it, which was, of course, uh, a big deal. You know, it kind of beat the uh, C3 Corvette to that. Uh, absolutely gorgeous styling on the car. You've got this wide split grille in the traditional Pontiac style. You've got sort of half-covered uh, stacked headlights, which are absolutely gorgeous. Uh, this one's a California black plate car. I think that's kind of a big deal in the car world, the collector car world, and uh, appears to have a keep on streaking license plate frame. So that seems a bit, um, I don't know, when the hell was all that exciting? I mean, the 70s? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, streaking. Okay, I'm just going to leave that without too much more comment. Uh, but it's got very, very attractive lines all around. The Coke bottle styling, you know, the pinched waist, uh, the way it swoops in towards the uh, underneath of the body lines at the door and then swoops back out for the rockers. Uh, you've got sort of a limited trim on it. I mean, obviously there's chrome everywhere compared to a new car, uh, but compared to cars at the time, the chrome was quite muted and uh, probably a part of that sort of Euro 
European modern look that Pontiac guys were going for at the time. So you've got lovely chrome around the uh, headlights and around the grill, the bumpers of course, little leading edge chrome strip at the front of the hood, but that's it. Uh, stainless wipers, chrome windshield surround, very, very nice. Uh, this doesn't have those big eight lug wheels, which is kind of a shame because I love those things. A guy that I worked with years ago had an old Grand Prix, I think it was a 64 with the eight lugs, and they were just cool as shit. Uh, you've got sort of the Pontiac badge there with the checkered flag uh, on the uh, fenders. You've got traditional GM door handles with the push buttons that I like. Uh, you know, again, this was a car for sort of mature and somewhat affluent owners who, you know, Buicks were probably too dowdy, Cadillacs were too showy, uh, and they wanted a performance sort of car that still had fender skirts. And I think that's the role that the Bonneville filled. Uh, you see it as a Bonneville script at the back of the quarter panel, which is absolutely enormous. It's probably longer than a Miata. Uh, you've got an enormous hood uh, that sort of uh, comes back at a slight angle, not quite as swooped as it would have been on the uh, coupes. Uh, you've got six uh, independent lights at the back and a nicely angled, nicely integrated bumper treatment with more Bonneville script. You've got reverse lights in the bumper themselves. Uh, very, very low hood. I imagine this is the gas door way, way down here. Oh, God. For an old guy to get down to that and stick the nozzle in, that's kind of a misery. Uh, of course, you've got the uh, Pontiac Arrowhead uh, on the top of the hood, their, uh, you know, their badge. And all in all, it's just a strikingly attractive car. Very muscular, very sensual, and uh, very befitting of what Pontiac was shooting for at the time. I think it all came together really, really nice. Um, you know, and it's a bit reserved in the trim department. You've got that lovely sort of stainless treatment at the bottom of the rockers. Uh, you know, chrome mirrors, chrome this, but no chrome body line, no real bling on the hood. You've got no... <coughs> excuse me, uh, light indicators on the top of the fenders. Uh, it's a very, very streamlined car. And uh, just enough to get noticed without going into the bling territory. So uh, I think it's really attractive to look at. Let's have a look inside the trunk. If I can find the keys in my pocket. I know I'm not gonna pick the right key first. I never do, but we'll try. There's just a little keyhole hidden in there between the E and the V, and I did pick it, so there we go. And uh, there you go. There's a trunk to be envious of. Uh, I don't see a spare tire. Probably goes where that towel is, so, you know, hopefully we don't get a flat. And I've got all my bag of crap. Got my flask of coronavirus whiskey there. This was a very cool old flask. A very nice uh, viewer sent me once, and I've just enjoyed using the hell out of it. It's been fantastic. And I've drained that this morning, but, you know, my nephew nephew and nephew. My brother-in-law just got there. I mean, the guy's like triple boosted and vaccinated and, you know, every, all the microchips are floating around inside him and he still gets the bloody thing and he's still down and out. So, you know, obviously that thing doesn't do what it's purported to. But anyway, you could fit a lot of crap in this trunk. You'd fit like 50 suitcases, no issue. You could fit a dozen toddlers. You could have a whole daycare inside this trunk. You know, put down a little if you want, a little mattressy thing on the bottom, stick your toddlers in there, close the trunk, and they're gonna be just fine. Uh, still all the original cardboardy trim and the body color, the interior color, which looks nice. And, um, you know, there it is. So, uh, nice original. And yeah, I see a little bit of rust up there on the floorboard, kind of surfacey stuff. You know, Uncle Johnny, some of his cars are absolutely mint, and some are just drivers. But the one common theme with him is that they they have to be as original as possible. He just loves cars that are as original. I mean, he won't. A restored car means nothing to him. It's got to be the way that it came from the factory. And, you know, that's the neat thing about the collector world is everybody has a different idea of how it works. And uh, I do appreciate the way Johnny thinks. Have a look under the hood. And, of course, under the hood was what made Pontiac's uh, kind of special at the time. I mean, every company was going for, uh, where the hell is the release? There we go. This is going to be really heavy for a one-handed thing, but we're going to try it left-handed, no less. Oh my God. That is a long and heavy hood. 
those hood hinges could probably support Rosie O'Donnell. Uh, but anyway, here it is. So look, this is a 389. Uh, this was the base engine in this car. Came with a Carter AFB four barrel. Basically the same base engine that would have gone in the GTO of the same year and uh, was terrific. But they also had an optional 421, uh, which had more pep and uh, also a base Carter four barrel. But either the 389 or the 421 could get that tri-power setup, uh, which again was a um, you know Pontiac effort to add performance under the hood of their cars. Uh, absolutely cool. Uh, this is made in this 65 would have been the first year of the turbo uh, Hydra 400 tranny. Um, the Turbo Hydra 400 transmission, which is an absolutely bulletproof three speed automatic uh, that um, could handle the torque of these increasingly, you know, peppy engines that uh, the car, uh, you know, companies were putting in them. So, uh, very good year for this car to have that trans. Um, also, wishbones up front. I think, if I see it right, we've got an anti sway bar down there, uh, which again harkens to Pontiac's performance. It's got trailing arm in the back with a uh, floating axle, uh, four-wheel drum brakes, which, uh, you know, are over-assisted. When I first pulled this thing out of this garage, I always launched myself through the windshield. They're just that touchy and that heavily assisted. Uh, of course, power steering, because you'd have arms like Popeye if you had to drive this thing without it. And uh, otherwise, everything looking pretty original in the way it came under the hood, which is the way Johnny wants it. So, um, you know, all pretty neat under there. And uh, the, uh, you would go on, of course, as uh, Pontiac, but the engines got bigger, they got more peppy, they got more potent, uh, all the way up to the Malays era. And even after Pontiac kept that going with like the 455 Super Duty, and um, you know, they really held on to the bitter end. They clawed their way to having a muscle car, even in 1979, when really nobody else did. So, uh, all very cool. So, look, I'm going to pause it there for a minute again, and uh, then we're going to uh, hop inside, have a look at the interior, and go for a drive. Bear with me. All right, so let's have a look inside this thing. I decided not to run the top. Uh, you know, Johnny has it sort of buttoned down nice. Uh, obviously, it's a power top. It's white. Um, it's pretty cool, but, you know, I don't know. With my luck, the thing probably won't go down again or go halfway up or something, so I'm just going to leave it in place. Uh, I'm surprised by how short the door is in a car this long, and I presume they didn't extend it further into the back because of that sort of fluid hump that... Uh, uh, comes up on the rocker band. The door would have looked kind of strange and the window would have been a weird design. Uh, so it actually has a fairly short door, I think, for such a long car, uh, but still manages to look great. Uh, in the back seat, your true vintage 60s, you know, your Canadians are going to be real chipper back there. You've had probably four of them across, assuming they're not the fat kind. And, uh, they, you know, they're going to, they got ashtrays, they got window cranks, they got a little speaker in the middle. Uh, you can see this still has the original leather with all the cracking in it. That's the kind of shit that Johnny really likes. The original carpet, plenty of leg room. Uh, you can fold the seat up, of course, to uh, get the, uh, in and out pretty easily. Uh, the Bonnevilles didn't come with center consoles. That was a big difference between them and the uh, Grand Prix, which were, of course, very similar size. The Grand Prix, uh, you could have the center console. The Bonneville, eh, they're all bench. So, uh, here it is. I mean, I think you could, obviously, you fit six people people in here, no issue. I think you could fit eight people in here with no issue, uh, which just sort of goes to the point that these old, big American luxury cars were the SUVs of the time. Uh, you can see the door panels original with sun damage up on the top. Of course, this was a California car, so it got scorched. But again, you know, that's Johnny. He loves them the way they came. He'd much rather have this uh, than a reproduction door panel. You got a nice little armrest here. That's been recovered. Uh, the driver's seat, this side of it has been recovered. Uh, that must have been just too far gone to save. And uh, otherwise, the car is pretty much as it came. Love the little carpety trim in the bottom. Love the little chrome door pull handle. This operates the little smoking vent window 
on the side, has a remote mirror, which of course a fancy option at the time, and uh, no power windows in this one. does have a window crank, which I have to say absolutely makes the snowflakes go crazy. Uh, they love crank windows because they've just never seen them. It's just not a thing in, uh, in snowflake world. Uh, you've got this pencil thin steering wheel with little grippities at the nine and three that are kind of interesting. Uh, some of the real wood trim, this car had actual genuine wood, uh, has flaked off the veneer. You see the glue and whatnot behind it. Horn works, nice big Pontiac horn. Uh, more of the veneer on the dash, you know, real but flaking, but looks incredibly cool. Big, cr I mean, man, when I was driving this thing this morning with the street lights glinting off it, it was absolutely gorgeous. Just gorgeous. Uh, you've got your climate control here, Pontiac heater, very nice. You got good ventilation. You got chrome anywhere, everywhere to, uh, you know, really blind you in the sun. Uh, you got a big horizontal 120 mile an hour speedo with enormous turn signal indicators. Uh, being the Turbo Hydro 400, it was the first year where it was sort of a PRN DSL. Uh, in the, uh, if this was a 64, reverse would have been at the tail end, which just didn't make as much sense. So um, this was uh, kind of a fresh modern era type thing. Uh, I presume these are going to be your wipers here. Uh, if they were ever indicated, they're not now. I know these are the headlights. Uh, this is obviously your climate control uh, stuff. You can flow through and get high, low, medium, blower. Mm, yeah. Uh, this thing here is the other side of that. I feel this might be a dummy knob because Oh no, no, it's coming out. That's your lighter. Look at that. So you got your cigarette lighter there. And uh, there, of course, your radio knobs. Uh, down here, you've got his and hers ashtrays. Lovely stuff. Uh, you got your fuel gauge, your battery. Um, uh, it's not a voltmeter. It's an ammeter, whatever they call it. Your clock. Uh, all angled towards the driver, BMW style, but many years before. Uh, you've got a great little low shit handle right on the dashboard with the Bonneville script above it. Uh, you got a push button lock ashtray, which, you know, you could fit any sort of giant uh, 70s revolver in that thing with no issue at all. It's just going to fit. Lovely little thin chromey mirror up here with the uh, sun visors. You do have a cocaine mirror. I don't think they were doing that in the 60s, but at least not most people. And uh, it seems to be very firmly bolted in place, which is interesting. So, And of course, you do have a tranny hump. You do have a transmission hump that, um, you know, is going to interfere with the uh, center passenger, but yeah, you'll figure it out. They'll straddle it. And look at the size of these pedals. I mean, they're made for Andre the Giant. I don't care how big your feet are, they're going to work on those pedals. And uh, being a 60s car, you got your uh, headlight dimmer over there. So anyway, let's fire this thing up and go for a drive. I'm putting it in upside down Chrysler style. A little shot. Come on, there we go. Listen to that. And then the way the hood torques over when you hit it a little bit. Oh man, that's just cool. Uh, here's your power top control here and uh, weird speaker fader control, I presume, uh, where you could go between the front and the rear speaker. Yeah, you know, for whatever reason. I'm not going to bother with the seat belt because, yeah, what the hell, we're in 1965, so let's get it in gear and go for a spin. I love the vista over the front of the um, uh, the hood. I love the way the fenders are raised uh, on the sides. I could see the little chrome strip there in the middle. Uh, you got your suicide wipers, which are very cool. Uh, the chrome continues inside the car, all the better to glint and blind you with as you're driving along. And uh, it's just a... <laughs> Man, is it a lovely feeling to drive this thing. You got incredibly over-assisted power steering on this pencil-thin wheel. I could steer it with my pinky. And, uh, you know, man, what a cruiser. What a big, fantastic cruiser. Truly from the heyday of American automotive design and engineering, you know. Before the world all became unanimous. Everything became so similar you know all the car it, it, there was a time when european cars were really european and when american cars were really american and that just doesn't exist anymore you know maybe it's because it had to be that way but it's a shame it's a shame the distinction is gone 
Uh, going down Peters Road, you can see all the yard waste. Um, this is a double whammy sort of thing, you know? Uh, one, yeah, a lot of yard waste did get dislodged by the hurricane and floated all over the place. But some of these people also take advantage of the free, uh, easy pickup of yard waste that comes in after hurricanes. They clean out their yards, they dump big piles of it in the front, and it gets carted off for free. And that is a nice little benefit of the, uh, of the days after a hurricane. Other places that were hit a lot harder than this, yeah, it's for real. You know, they're putting houses up at the front to get carted off. You know, here, yeah, it's basically just yard waste. If it wasn't for that surge, man, this wouldn't really have been that big a deal for Florida at all. Uh, would have been just like any of the other hurricanes that hit us. Uh, that, uh, that surge, that, yeah, that's what took us out. And uh, honestly, it's a damn shame. Man, is it very peppy. I don't think it's geared for stoplight to stoplight. I think it's got highway gearing, but it's got so much torque, it doesn't matter. <laughs> A little bit of tire squeal there. I don't think it's posy either. But man, is it peppy. It just gets up and moves. Um, you know, this car feels very tight together and original. Uh, steering wheel's a little bit off-center, but it tracks down the road really nice and gives you a feeling of what it was like in 1965 uh, to drive one of these big sort of luxury cruisers that is a bygone era. We're just never getting it back. We'll never have another vehicle like this again, and uh, I think that's a damn shame. So anyway, there it is, 1965 Pontiac Bonneville Convertible. Lovely vehicle to drive, beautiful design, uh, and, uh, you know, just a great cruiser. <laughs> Holy shit. I don't know if that's us or... Yeah, that's us. We lost the hubcap. All right, I'm going to have to turn around and get that. <laughs> Johnny will be so pleased. God, that scared the crap out of me. Nobody's lost a hubcap on the road since 1978. Anyway, look, thanks for having a look. I'm going to go retrieve this hubcap now, and um, I guess we'll see you with the next one. I have a bunch of cars. The minute I get them ready, we're going to get them coming up. The hurricane threw me for a loop, I won't deny. I don't even know the condition of the motorhome. Haven't gone to look at it yet. We'll see if that still exists. And uh, otherwise, thank you so much for watching, and uh, we'll keep going as much as we can. Take care, and I'll see you with the next one.